suit suit was uh, an incredible moment in uh, uh, not only in my own life but in in, in the art form in theater um, Luis Valdez is truly one of the most gifted playwrights uh, that America has produced as well as especially a, a Latino um, he had been doing theater since the early 60s and um, he had worked with uh, Cesar Chavez in the fields and did El Teatro Campesino, which was his group. And they really helped in the, in the real plight of the Chicano movement at the, in the 65, 64, 65, 66, and into 67, 68 when it really took hold. They were in the fields with Cesar helping bring awareness through their art form of theater and agiprop theater, really, on the back of, of stake bed trucks. You'd drive out to the field and then they would put on little actos acts. And it was amazing what this man had done, him and his brother. And uh, so now they were, had done their own theater and now they were brought into the mainstream by the Mark Tabor Forum. And the year was 1978. And actually it was 77 when we, the end of 77 is when they started rehearsals. And, um, and I remember, I think it was February 14th when we, 1978 is when we put on the very first, it was called Baby Zooter. It was a 14, um, I take it back, it wasn't, and it was all taking place because it was 14 days of rehearsals and 10 days of, of doing the play. And so we started rehearsing at the begin right after the first of the year. And uh, it, it, became arguably the most prolific piece of artistic work that had been done in the United States of America on Latin Americans in the history of theater. It was the first major piece of work to make it onto Broadway ever, dealing with Latino themes. Uh, people say, well, you had uh, you know, West Side Story. He said, yeah, but studying West Side Story, being a Latino piece, is like saying you know, South Pacific represents the uh, Pacific Islanders, you know, just... <laughs> They're using it as a, you know, as, as a housing body to create the story, but it really wasn't about the Puerto Rican experience as much as it was about the music and song and dance. And, and it, yeah, it had a lot, but the story was really powered by an interesting uh, cultural dynamic. But Zoot Suit was strictly 100% Latin. And... Uh, so when we, when we unleashed it, it, was, it became very, very interesting. And um, it hit very hard in the Baby Zooter. And they brought it back for the main season. And it was going to open the main season. It was so successful. And I think we started sometime in June. I think it was going to be the, the main, th uh, I think it was three months running at the Mark Taper Forum. And that was the first time that they really were putting on a play dealing with the Latin culture and the history of American theater in, you know, in a big way, on main, main stages. And uh, so we started rehearsing uh, about, I would say, the end of March, beginning of April, and we started to rehearse. And it went very, very well. Rehearsals came really well. All the kids that were involved were really ready and a lot of good performances all the way across the board. Many of the kids that went on to went on to become very well established artists in, in acting and theater and, and motion picture and television. And uh, so we started and it became a shot heard around the world. And not only did it have an impact in the United States of America because people were coming from all over. It started off with just in the LA County area, but then it quickly spread out to the surrounding states and people would drive in. Then pretty, pretty soon people were flying in from uh, New York to watch the play and uh, of course the uh, Schubert's came in you know and uh, Bernie and Jerry Schoenfeld Barry made they both rest in peace wonderful great great uh, people who ran the Schubert's at that time they came in and saw the piece and uh, wanted to take it to New York and at that moment, we had moved from the Mark Taper after three months, and they bought the Aquarius Theater, this uh, center theater group, uh, bought the, the Aquarius, and they put us in there, and we were sold out for years, sold out. 
and uh, people would come 20, 25 times to see the play. It really became a, a, not only a cultural event, but a really coming out party of theater, American theater, to an entire, uh, you know, people who had never gone to the American theater ever in their lives were coming and watching theater for the first time. So it really became uh, a very positive thing. And boy, pretty soon we had the, uh, it was amazing. We had uh, five uh, uh, Kabuki families that came from Japan to watch the play. The Kahali Indian Theater came from India to watch the play, families uh, or theater groups. Uh, the entire Russian Moscow Theater and two chartered planes came to watch the play. And it became like much more than anybody had anticipated in respects of the way that it was hitting the world. And from this little piece that was generated right here at the Hollywood and at the old Arrow Carroll Theater, it became a growth that was resonating to the whole planet. And especially my character, which was El Pachuco. And it was culminated with one night, uh, Sir Sebastian and the entire Royal Shakespearean Company flew from London to watch the play. It was amazing, you know, because I mean, we didn't know what was going on. We just knew that we were just East LA kids that were trying hard to do something you know, original and help Luis Valdez, who had written an extraordinary piece of work on the Sleepy Lagoon murder case and had done it so beautifully. It was just exquisite to watch. I, I got to see it because there was kids that, that took over our, our production. When we went to New York, they, they left the company here. So I got to see the play, which was fantastic. And I got to see why people were so, whoa, well, you know, they appreciated it. And the Royal Shakespearean Company came in, and, and uh, they were dressed in uh, evening clothes, all of them, uh, you know, tuxedos, long gowns, totally. I mean, the whole group came in to go to the theater, and for them going to the theater was, a, you know, that was a very classic event. So they were all dressed up, and you could see them, and they were all, the women were six foot three, you know. <laughs> Everybody was just like, wow. They were all the Shakespearean company, the whole company, and the head of the company at that time. They came in, and when we were done, the green room was large, very large green room, so it could house around 300 people in the green room, and they were, every night was jam-packed. And so I came out, of, after going up and performing, I came out, and cleaned up, came out, and people would, yay, you know, applause and stuff, and you'd greet people and it was all fun. And, and I looked over and I saw this group. I didn't know they were in the audience. And I saw this group dressed in formal gowns and uh, they were they turned and they looked at me and then they opened up and, and opened like this. And there was this elderly man, very distinguished man, who was the head of the, of the uh, Royal Shakespearean Company. He comes walking up to me and he says to me, uh, I want to congratulate you on creating the first American character that could actually walk onto a Shakespearean stage. You know, it was beyond me. I said, what? You know, to myself. I mean, I said, to him, I said, thank you very much for your kindness and your respect. It's incredible. And it was true. It was so stylish. That's the way the Kabuki and Kahali people who I had I'd worked and studied their theater. And so I understood, you know, the intricacies of, you know, everything, you know, just the most minute hand movement. And the thing was, meant something to all these people. And I didn't know what it meant, but I just saw them doing it and it was very exact. And I said, wow. So I used it. I used a lot of the technique that I'd seen, especially in Kabuki. And, um, and, uh, and also the elegance of Shakespeare and the way that they would handle themselves and the way that they would, you know, and they felt very natural. I said, wow. And so I used all of that in, in my character. And this is a street kid. I mean, Pachuca was a culmination of, of um, all the streetwise people on the planet. And we found out that the Greeks had a, a Pachuco, that the uh, Armenians had one. And there was these streetwise people that really were just like understood and really controlled the streets with their presence. And they used to use pride, self-esteem, self-respect as a shield in front of them to hold it down the presence, you know. 
And I, I said, wow. And so when we, I, I was raised around these kids when I lived in East LA. And I would watch them and this is how they worked, this is how they were, and the attitude was just real pronounced. And um, so I used all that. And, and then we spoke a, a, a language that had been, and still is one of the disappearing languages on the planet, it's called Calo, C-A-L-O. And Calo is a mixture between Spanish, Gypsy, and English, all mixed together. And it's very different. So it was, they used it along the border of El Paso and Juarez, which is where um, the Los Chucos Suave del Paso is where that Los Pachucos comes from the word. And so they ended up, you know, that was the where they were coming from, but there was a lot of Pachucos in, in my street, you know, guys that were streetwise and very much inside of that style. So I was raised with them. So when, when I got the opportunity to audition for um, Luis and his brother Danny at the Mark Taper, um, I knew that culture. I knew, I'd never seen it written, Calo. I never saw, seen that character performed ever. And I, but I'd seen him on the streets, and so I was aware of the situation. And so I knew immediately upon going into the audition that there was something being done here that had never been seen before and never been done. And so I had a wide open palette, and I knew these people. So I said, okay. And so, and I had, remember, I'd been singing and dancing and performing since, you know, when I was 14 years old and um, dancing at 10. So here we are at 31. And finally, they asked me in 1978 to put it all together. And I did it. And uh, it was an incredible moment in time. And it was a shot heard around the world. <laughs>